Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 419 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Eilon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and an author. Our fifth book just came out for Christmas. It's called Perseverance and How to Be a Great Fraternity or Sorority Alumnus. So go and pick up that book on either Amazon or Barnes & Noble today. So we call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, I am working on my dissertation right now. It's on hazing prevention. I'm so excited to start answering some very real questions on things like the definitions of hazing that kind of run the, the gamut, uh, how different hazing looks depending on which fraternity or sorority council it might be. And also speaking to student affairs professionals to learn when is the right time to step in and to intervene. So there's so much great research and I can't wait to just really uncover all of it. Our next guest actually wrote her dissertation on the power of relationships, navigating the dance of change through executive coaching. So you know right away, this is gonna be a great interview today. Our guest is Dr. Jennifer Nash. She is a Fortune 50 executive advisor, a consultant, an author who works with successful executives at ExxonMobil, Ford, Google, JP Morgan Chase, Verizon, IBM, the Boeing Company, and many other global organizations, as well as startups, just to evaluate their performance and also evolve into the people leaders they were meant to be to become the best versions of themselves. What makes all of Jennifer's clients feel really confident in hiring her is number one, she has 16 years of professional coaching experience. Number two, her experience serving in leadership and executive roles over a 25 year career at EDS, Kelly Services, Ford Motor, uh, and Deloitte Consulting. And number three, she has a track record of successful client outcomes. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Mike. I'm so excited to be here. I am so excited to have you on the show. You have so much great information to share with our college student listeners. And so I always like to start here. You decided on Central Michigan for your undergraduate degree. I absolutely love that campus. Shout out to Sigma Pi on that campus. Love you guys. Um, so why did you choose Central Michigan? I know that you kind of started off at a community college, right? Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. So I, I put myself through school. And so I spent two years at the local community college, which was Delta College in University Center, Michigan, if anybody knows of it. Um, and then I uh, transferred up to Central Michigan University. It was close to my parents' house. And so I could, you know, drive back and forth when I needed to. Uh, and I lived on campus when I was there. So that was my first time, you know, living away from home, which was super cool. Um, and it was just, you know, I thought it was a great value for the money, um, you know, in comparison to some of the other schools that were maybe out of my reach, you know, from a financial perspective, um, you know, Central Michigan was a place where I felt like I could get a really quality education um, at a price that was something that I could um, work with and, you know, work enough jobs during the summer and throughout the year, you know, to pay for. Fire up chips. I absolutely love it. Very, very nice. And you also, you worked for Deloitte Consulting for many years. And I'm wondering, because you were coaching the consultants that were working there, how did you develop their leadership skills and their interpersonal savvy? Yeah, you know, so Deloitte was amazing because it had a huge focus on people development. So right from the meet, even before you came in the door, you know, there was a focus on how do we help you grow and evolve to be your best self? And that permeates throughout, you know, your work life, through your home, like everything. So even before I came in the door, there were learning events that were helping me, you know, build some of those consulting skill set that maybe I didn't have when I came in. Um, there were events helping me learn how to network, right, and build that those connections with people where it's not just a transaction, it's more of a transformational experience. Um, so what each person learns and shares and grows and evolves instead of it being a, you know, a transfer transaction where, you know, just one person gains value and the other person walks away with nothing. Mm -hmm. um, once I was in Deloitte Consulting, you know, the focus on continual learning and growth and development um, happened constantly. So, you know, we were always encouraged to take, you know, different types of courses that were available at no cost because the company paid for those. 
um, at every milestone point where you shifted your trajectory, um, you were put into like a tap, which was, you know, tap into your potential, um, you know, like the manager workshop, for example, where you learned another set of skills and how to be successful at that manager level, you know, selling work, developing those client relationships, and then also leading people, right? Leading a team. So there were different skills at different points that they would help you grow and evolve. Wow. That is a really nice place to land. Uh, yeah, it was I'm amazing. Really, I bet it was. Yeah. That is really hard cool. to get to. Trust me, hard to get to. I but bet. once you're there, it, and it was hard to stay, you know, it was, yeah. it's a challenge. So I loved it. I loved working with really smart people and working with clients who had these wicked problems to solve that, you know, challenged me in a way that I hadn't been challenged before. Yeah, definitely a great place to work. And it kind of sets you up for what you're doing now, which is you're the founder and CEO of your own coaching and consulting company. You work with yeah. these Fortune 50 organizations, Google, Ford, ExxonMobil, JP Morgan, IBM, Boeing, Verizon. I mean, we can go on and on, but you help these successful leaders to connect people and mm -hmm. in terms of their performance to deliver exceptional results. And I'm wondering, because there's a lot of like entrepreneurs that listen to this show that yeah. they want to build their own company. How do you build a book of business like that for your own company with clients that are as big as this? You know, it's a great question. And I have a lot of people ask me that question. And so one of my answers is always, you want to build relationships before you need them. So you never know in your life where you're going to meet someone and how you can help them. And maybe if they have something, you know, that they could contribute to your life. And I also believe that universe puts us in the path of people. Um, there's no coincidence about that. So, you know, be attentive to who crosses your path and the unexpected conversations that you can have. You don't ever know where those are going to lead. And I think too, you know, I was open early in my career, in my entrepreneurial journey to doing things that maybe didn't bring me the most money, but they brought me a lot of experience. And so I learned from that and I gained different things through each of those experiences that helped me grow the relationships and build those connections so that I could have, you know, and be lucky enough to have a book of business like that at this point in my career. That's amazing. And I totally agree. I feel like people start like their networking process when they're looking for a job or they're looking right. for an internship. And I'm like, why are you starting now? Like you should be developing those relationships all the time. Uh, so that way, when the opportunity exists that you need a new job, you've already developed those relationships. It's almost too late to start networking when you're out of work and now you have right. no income. Um, right. so that's not, you know, a good situation. There's no time like the present get started now. And then yeah. you'll figure out later over time where they fit into your life. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's really smart. And we have so many fraternity and sorority leaders that are listening to your voice right now. Many of them are leading for the first time in their lives. They've never led an yeah. organization, right? Yeah. So what mistakes should they try to avoid when they're leading their members? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, it's so similar to the workplace where when people are, you know, sort of tapped on the head and told, oh, all of a sudden you're going to be leading people now instead of leading projects and tasks, and they're not given the tools that they need to do that. So um, take heart. You know, we are here to help you. Um, if you want support in building those skill set and people leadership, um, reach out, ask questions, you know, ask my questions drop me a note at my website, ask me questions. So one of the mistakes that I so often see people, leaders of people do is that they lead people with the same tools that they use to lead projects or they lead tasks. People are not projects or tasks. So you need to develop a different skill set than maybe you have in your toolbox today. So that's one mistake to avoid. Mm -hmm. I think the second mistake to avoid is that you lead people as you would want to be led. That is not necessarily what's most effective. What you need to figure out is how do they want to be led? How do they want to follow you? What's going to inspire them to look to you as that leader setting that vision? You know, do you have a vision? That's another mistake that I often see. There isn't a vision. So what can people follow? They don't know what to follow. So being clear about the vision, understanding that people want to be led in the way that works best for them. Um, and then also um, having the tools that you need in your toolbox to lead people and not projects. 
I love it. Great, great mm -hmm. advice. I think it's so important. Setting that vision is critical. And just, you're absolutely right. I mean, everybody in your organization is motivated by something different. And I think it's really about trying to understand how they want to be led, but also what motivates them. Um, mm -hmm. So that way you can get maximum production. But the only way to find that out is to ask them, <laughs> have a conversation. Exactly. I mean, yeah, you're not going exactly. to know this by osmosis just because you're hanging out in the same circles. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that actually makes me think about like another mistake mistake that leaders so often make, right? Leaders, and maybe this is because it was role modeled to them, like from adults in their life, mm. but leaders often think they have to have all the answers. Right. They don't have to have all the answers. They mm. have to have the great questions. And so my book that's back there, Be Human, Lead Human, mm -hmm. it's a it's actually a roadmap for people who have never been leaders before to figure out how they want to lead. How do they want to show up? How do they want to define that role? What's important to them? What are the values that they're going to use to define the decisions that they have to make as a leader? Mm, so that may be a helpful resource. Yeah, that's a great resource. It's called Be Human, Lead Human. Go and pick up Jennifer's book. And I think for all of our student listeners that are new to leadership, this is a great resource for you. Now, the other thing that happens a lot within these fraternities and sororities is that there's always conflict. 100% of the time, yeah. There are members that are fighting with each other for whatever reason. So yeah. what are your tips for these student leaders when they see that conflict in their organization? Yeah. So most of the time, what I see with leaders is that they want to avoid conflict. Mm -hmm. Most people do not want to deal with it. So they just shove it under the rug and pretend it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work because what happens is it manifests and it gets bigger. And then it becomes this massive issue where you're pole vaulting over mouse turds and it doesn't need to be that. So the first thing I would suggest is when there is conflict, identify what the conflict is. What is the problem? Focus on the problem and not the person. That's a mistake I often see leaders make. Mm -hmm. So getting clear about what the problem is and distancing that from the person and focus on that problem and how can you resolve it? Yeah. Don't ignore those problems. They do only get worse over time. So I you do. want to deal with it as quickly as you can. It reminds me of, I went to this one fraternity house. I'm not going to mention the campus, um, but I went to this one house and they had a bathroom door and there was like yellow, like caution tape in an X over the door. And I'm like walking through the house and I'm like, what's on the other side of that door? And they're like, right. oh, Mike, you don't, you don't want to go in there. Like they there's all kinds of problems. And I said, I believe you, but understand yeah. that, that problem is not going to get better over time. <laughs> Whatever is behind that door, okay? Right. It's going to get worse. you got to deal with the problem. <laughs> yeah, maybe magically that X will be like an invisibility shield and it just won't be there when they open it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so great. <laughs> anyway, so the other thing I want to talk to you about too is like retention. Okay. And this uh -huh. is a big thing in higher ed right now that we're really trying yeah. to figure out. Sometimes it's really difficult to keep our members or our employees and our company. So how do we right. ensure that we retain our best members or our best employees? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, you're absolutely right. Organizations today are struggling with retention mm -hmm. and you know, with the Greek system, I'm sure there are different um, levers that are of interest to members and why they join the Greek system, right? Mm -hmm. So understanding, again, this goes back to what we talked about before, right? When someone joins your Greek fraternity or sorority, what's their motivating factor for that? What's important to them about that? Why did they join? What are they looking to get out of that? Mm -hmm. And so if you can understand those drivers for each person in your organization, and then keep those in mind as you're interacting with that person, right? So maybe, for example, someone joined your organization because um, they wanted to build community and they wanted to gain a sense of belonging, you know, for, for the group and for the university. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you might be able to have them do, if that's, if that's a need in the organization, is to have them schedule some social events, right? Connect with people, figure out what they want, bring people together, create that sense of community. So understanding those motivational drivers of why people are joining in the first place can help you understand how to retain them in the long run. I love it. And you absolutely hit the nail on the head. The number one reason why people leave fraternities and sororities is because of misaligned expectations. They yes. came into the organization expecting X and yes. then what they actually got was Y. 
Okay. Yeah. And that, you know, if we think about, you know, community service is supposed to be a big part of fraternity and sorority life. Well, if 95% of your calendar is social events and like less than 5% is community service, and they're like, wait a minute, you said you guys were all about community service. We, we have done like one event all year. It doesn't seem like you really mean what you say. And so that misaligned expectations, that's where it com comes into play. Mm -hmm. um, so really, really good stuff. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about too is social skills, because the students yeah. that I'm working with today at college campuses, they're obviously so tied to their smartphones. I mean, if they yes. left their smartphone back in the dorm room, like they feel naked, they have to go back to get it before they can function. So how can college students improve their social skills, which I think is a key trait that today's employers are looking for? Yeah, Mike, they are absolutely looking for that. And I just came across an article yesterday that said that some of the Gen Zers who are applying for their first jobs, mm -hmm. their parents are coming to the job interview with them. Oh, no, no. Okay, let me just tell your people listening, like, do not do that. Yeah. <laughs> you need to go to the job by yourself, okay? So if your parent is there, that's a problem. Yeah. And you probably won't get the job. Anyway, so just public service announcement. Sure. Um, so building those social skills, right? We, I, I cannot wait to see the research that is done for people that have had brains that have been so attached to these devices and have these constant stimuli taking place, right? And it's sort of an addictive kind of thing. That's why they have to go back to the dorm room and get the phone because they're lacking that stimulus anyway. So I can't wait to see that research when, when some you know college researchers finally do that. But I think, you know, building the social skills that we need to be effective in today's world, um, there are so many ways that you can do that. The first way is to just simply put down the phone and talk to someone, have a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, so much of the feedback I get from recruiters and from, you know, um, employers is that, you know, the people coming in, they don't, they lack the social skills to have conversations. And it's very different, as you know, when you have a conversation with someone, when you're tapping, texting and talking to them via a screen, mm -hmm. it's completely different when you're in person. The other thing I notice is that there is an inability to read the room or read the body language or read the emotional you know, tenor that is coming from a person because they haven't had that interaction like growing up. You know, they've been on screens their whole life. So I think making a concerted effort to build some of those social skills. And again, in my book, there is a huge amount of um, tools and techniques and practice that they can do to build social skills and gain that maybe lost ground that they could have had, but didn't have because of the pandemic, especially. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, you know, these students, they're getting dopamine hits every time that their phone gives them a notification. And exactly. so you're absolutely right. That's why they're going back because they feel naked without it. Yeah. Um, and uh, ultimately, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see where we go. But even like just dating, I mean, if they're on their app and they're swiping right or left in order to get a date and they're not having that in-person conversation, then they're missing out on all of these developing all of these social skills. And then it's like they get into, you know, the workforce and it's just not there. It's not developed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we have to figure out uh, what we can do to improve that. And I think, you know, you have some really, really good ideas there in your book. Of course, it's Be Human, Lead Human, How to Connect People and Performance. You talk about multiple environmental factors that have changed in the workplace yeah. while uh, leadership has really stayed the same. Like we've kind of yeah. plateaued there. So yeah. what are these multiple environmental factors that we need to be aware of in the workplace? Mm hmm. You know, the first and foremost was the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. The pandemic really, the pandemic really created Pandora's box. So for some of your listeners, they probably don't remember because they weren't, you know, old enough at that point. But the, the world of work before was like, everybody got up, they got ready, they drove to work, or they took the train into work. They worked in an office, you know, eight hours, nine hours a day, right? Because they had an hour break for lunch. And then they would take the train or drive back home. Um, and that was their day. And they did that every day. Yeah. And so what happened with the pandemic was all of a sudden, now organizations had to figure out how to allow people to work remotely, which for the most part hadn't been done before. And somehow 
they figured it out because before when you would ask to work remotely or telecommute or work from home or have any kind of different schedule than being in the office, it was normally shot down. I mean, I asked many times to do that and I never was able, I was never allowed to do that. I always had a pager that I had to carry around, you know, so people would page me when they needed me, you know, before cell phone time, right? Yeah. Um, but the pandemic changed all that. And all of a sudden people are working from home. And so now you have, instead of this division between work and home, you literally have people working out of their closets at home. You have people trying to figure out how to work from their kitchen tables. You've got the messiness of life all displayed, you know, cats walking across the screen, kids running in the room, you know, all of these kinds of things happening that didn't have happen before. And until Zoom figured out how to blur the background on the screen, you know, we saw all of that, right? We saw this, this, this messiness of human life come into play. And what happened at that point was leaders didn't know what to do with that, right? They had these tools that sort of worked in the office, but all of a sudden when the game changed and people need, didn't have childcare and they needed to adjust their schedule because they had to take care of their kids or their parents, leaders were just sort of sitting there going, wow, I don't have anything in my toolkit to deal with this. So I don't know what to do with this. So there were so many factors that happened because of the pandemic, right? And on top of that, we've got this massive change happening from a technological standpoint. We have AI coming into the picture, right? Mm -hmm. We have all of these different economic factors happening where it's impacting the global, <clears throat> excuse me, the global markets with the war in Ukraine. Right. That completely changed how, you know, the, the balance of power was working and, and tensions, you know, globally. So all of these different factors happened that changed the workplace and it will no longer be what it was. And that's why I talk about it as Pandemic's box has been pan, pan, sorry, Pandora's box has been opened and it will never go back to what it was. And so the Gen Zers and, you know, the people in the university community now and the Greeks, you know, they'll be coming into a workplace that is most likely going to be hybrid yeah. and they need to figure out how to work in that space. And maybe they're more comfortable working remotely because they're so used to screens, but they will need to figure out what does that look like when I go into the office? How do I behave? How do I act? What's acceptable business wear when I'm in the office? I'm getting a lot of feedback from employers that say people don't even know how to behave in the office. They don't know how to dress. They don't know where to sit. They don't understand. They need to put themselves on, you know, um, mute when something's coming in. They need to set their their watches on do not disturb or whatever it is. So the world has changed dramatically mm -hmm. and we need to help people. We need to prepare people for that from a career development standpoint so that when they get into that first job, they are successful and they're not fired within six months because they couldn't figure out how to behave properly in a space where maybe they've never been before. Yeah, the workforce is changing dramatically. Um, you mentioned some of them for sure. AI, my goodness, you know, that's another argument why I feel like we need to give assignments to our students to use AI when it's acceptable yes. and when it's not. Uh, you know, I'm not saying all assignments are going to be using AI, um, nor should they. But uh, you certainly have to give them these tools and get them to play with it and experiment with it and have projects with it because their employers are going to expect them to know how to use AI in order to be more efficient in the future. It's just a fact. Mm -hmm. Whether yeah. we agree with AI or we don't, it's it's here. And yeah. so, you know, I think if you're not using it right now, you're going to be left behind and you're going to be replaced by somebody that knows how to leverage AI to do their job better. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's really, really important that we get on that. I know there's a lot of uh, intimidation around AI in a higher ed environment, but I think we have to embrace it and figure out how we work with it. Um, yeah. So uh, just, uh, you know, a thought. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was roadmaps, because you develop mm -hmm. these actionable roadmaps. So that way your clients can become the leader that they aspire to be. How do you yes. develop these roadmaps for them? Yes. So, well, there, I want to um, invite you to think about that a little bit differently. So I don't develop the roadmap for them. I've given them a framework. Okay. And then I help them work their way through that roadmap. So they are actually creating a custom personalized roadmap for themselves based on the goals and outcomes that they are looking for. And the book actually walks them through that. There's this 12 step process for that. Wow, that is incredible. So everyone has to go out and pick up this book so that way we can develop our actionable yeah. roadmaps. Yeah. 
It's called yeah. Human, Lead Human, How to Connect People and Performance. Absolutely love all of this conversation. Now, you know, my weakness is food. Like I love <laughs> good food, okay? And yeah. I do get to, you know, Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan from time to time. I know you're very familiar there. They're now national champions, you know, in the football Go blue. arena. <laughs> I had to, sorry. <laughs> you know me, I did my MBA at Ross, so I have to like, put a plug in there for the guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, is there, when I do get to visit the national champions there in Ann Arbor, is there a particular restaurant that I need to go and check out? Oh my gosh. There are so many. Like, do you have a particular favorite food? I mean, I like it all. If you like okay. it, then I'm telling you, I'm going to like it because I've never met food that, you know, is good that I didn't like. So mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. going with your recommendations because you know it better than I do. And I eat everything. There's nothing off the table for me. Okay, so my favorite, absolute favorite Indian restaurant in Ann Arbor is called Madras Masala, and they are unbelievable. So they had a little fire, which um, is delayed. Maybe they're reopening, uh -huh. um, but hopefully they will be there when you go there. Otherwise, if you're looking for something that's a little more, you know, a little white tablecloth kind of place, but like great music and great ambiance, uh -huh. I would recommend the Earl. Very nice. Two great recommendations. Yeah. And I absolutely love Indian food. For me, like it's got to be like super spicy. I'm that guy that orders like the native, like 10 out of 10 <laughs> spice. Like I'm that guy. Um, yeah. So my favorite dish is like a chicken vindaloo or something like that. Just like super, super spicy. Um, and uh, Indian food. I mean, I'll eat garlic naan and chicken vindaloo until the cows come home. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to go and check out your recommendation when I visit the national champions, the University of Michigan. Very, very nice. All right. Awesome. So Jennifer, if our listeners, if they want to connect with you for coaching, they mm -hmm. need consulting work with you, they need mm -hmm. you to speak on their college campus, where should they go to connect with you? Yeah. So they're welcome to check me out at my website, which is drdrjennifernash.com. Um, and there they'll find a whole bunch of information on all the different services that I have, as well as the book um, and a whole bunch of free resources, too, if they're looking to build their leadership capability. I love it. Go and get those free resources. It's drjenniferNash.com. Go and check out the book. You can pick that up anywhere books are sold. Mm -hmm. Be Human, Lead Human, How to Connect People, and Performance. Jennifer, this has been phenomenal. Thank you so much for sharing all this great information with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun. I appreciate it. You got it. My pleasure. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed this talk with Jennifer, I want you to like it and I want you to share it on social media. That is super, super important. So that way more college students can get all the resources that Jennifer has to offer on her website with her coaching, consulting, and speaking. Thank you so much for listening. And we hope to see you on another episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.